so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, Earth's far ultraviolet emissions and how we can investigate the ionosphere and thermosphere um, using those emissions. A quick outline, we'll talk a little bit about uh, far ultraviolet emissions, um, then we'll talk a little bit about gravity waves in the thermosphere, um, something that I like to think about are solar terminator <coughs> waves, and then finally we'll finish up by talking a little bit about the equatorial ionospheric anomaly. But kind of woven into this will also be a gold mission overview. So I apologize to those who have probably heard this about four or five times now, but for those of you who haven't heard about it yet, um, there's some, some great stuff going on with gold. So energy is absorbed in the upper atmosphere, mostly uh, extreme ultraviolet ra radiation, which um, causes excitation, dissociation, ionization, fluorescence, different, different sorts of uh, photochemical reactions. Um, and one that's um, particularly um, useful for us as scientists is this one here where you have an O-ion and an electron, they go into an excited state and then you um, relax and get a, a photon out. So why uh, should we study the upper atmosphere in the far ultraviolet? Well, when you look at these two plots together, this kind of helps answer the question. So on the right, um, you have um, uh, spectra of what the Earth's atmosphere looks like um, in the upper atmosphere. Um, and what you can see is there is uh, an uh, oxygen emission at 135.6 nanometers. And then there's also a bunch of emissions from uh, N2, which are the lyman burge hopfield bands. And if you look on the left, you can see that the um, constituents of the atmosphere in the, above 100 kilometers above the um, mesopause are dominated by oxygen and nitrogen. And then as well as you can look uh, on the left-hand side of that plot, you can see the ionosphere is particularly dominated by that, that O+, plus, especially once you get above about 200 kilometers in altitude. Another really great reason to look at the atmosphere from above uh, in the far ultraviolet is that the atmosphere below provides an opaque background. So you don't get uh, light coming up from below, and you don't see um, uh, basically emissions from below. So you have a nice dark background to look at the, the thermosphere and ionosphere. So again, for those of you who haven't heard a whole lot about the GOLD mission, GOLD is a NASA mission of opportunity aboard um, the communication satellite SES-14, which is in geostationary orbit above the mouth of the Amazon River, uh, which is at about 47 and a half degrees west, so it gets a nice view of the western hemisphere. Um, and then, let's see, I don't have a pointer, but uh, the gold instrument itself are two identical independent imagers. And so it can scan both the disk and the limb. Uh, so up on the upper right hand, you can see uh, the satellite. And since I don't have a laser pointer, it's really hard for me to point out exactly where gold is on that satellite. But trust me, it's very small compared to the rest of the satellite. Um, and then the data we get from this um, basically are disk images that include uh, level one data products, which are radiance, and then level two products, which are temperature and composition of the ionosphere, or of the, should be composition of the thermosphere. Um, at nighttime, we get density of the ionosphere. And then we also scan the Earth's limb um, by limb scans, and we also do occultations, and we get temperature and densities of the thermosphere from that. There are four main science questions the mission uh, and its primary mission are looking to address. Um, and I like to think of these as being split into um, forcing from above and forcing from below. So in terms of forcing from above, we're looking at how geomagnetic storms affect the thermosphere and how the thermosphere responds to solar ultraviolet uh, variability. And then from below, we're talking about um, atmospheric waves and tides and how they affect uh, the temperature of the thermosphere. And then you can also think of questions where you have both forcing from above and below uh, that mix together and you have some questions there. And one of the questions we're trying to address is how the nighttime equatorial ionosphere responds to both forcing from above and below. Uh, so 
in terms of the instrument itself, it's an imaging spectrometer. So this is the gold instrument in the upper left-hand corner, uh, channel A and channel B. They're identical. And if you take channel B and you cut it right down the middle, you'll get a cross-section, which is shown in the lower left-hand corner. And light comes in from the left, bounces around a couple of times, and then it hits a diffraction grating, which splits the light into its various spectral components, which are then imaged by a detector. And what we get out of this, or what, what uh, our level 1C products are, are these image cubes, where each pixel has a horizontal and vertical location, and then each pixel has spectral information. So it's kind of like um, the colors that are in each of those uh, pixels. Um, just to reiterate, we're talking about the far ultraviolet, um, and this really helps us get at um, the temperature of the thermosphere as well as the constituents of the thermosphere. One of the things that we're really excited about with gold is that it's uh, imaging Earth from a geostationary vantage point instead of the low Earth orbiting satellites that make a pass and then don't get to repeat the same location for hours or days at a time. So by staring at the Earth at the same location, we're really hoping that this will revolutionize the way that we do um, upper atmospheric or space weather forecasting, um, just like that terrestrial weather forecasting was revolutionized by uh, geostationary um, observing of the troposphere. Um, and then just to remind you, we get um, full images at a, every 30 minutes. So if you're wondering how frequently we get an image, that's, that's how often. So more about the imaging spectrometer. I talked about how each pixel has a, um, an X and Y location on the, on the image, the disk. And then each of those pixels has a um, spectra that goes along with it. Um, this is from a uh, simulation from Stan Solomon, uh, where you see the slit of one of the instruments scanning across the disk of Earth in the simulation, and then on the right is the spectra that would be seen um, along that slit. So as we are scanning across the day side, um, you can see all the nitrogen bands, and then it'll flip and do the northern side, and you'll be able to see um, right about now little strong blips from the aurora and then when we go into the night side only the 1356 um, band remains visible. Um, one of the things that's really cool about gold is that the slip slit step rate is fully commandable and so you can envision different campaigns where you can um, basically tell it to scan a small area um, or dwell in a certain area. Um, and some of my, my colleagues have been working on, for example, um, the recent solar eclipse we had where it scanned certain areas. I mentioned the data products earlier, um, but we get uh, at level one radiance, and then in level two we get uh, O to N2 ratios uh, and temperature in the lower thermosphere. We get um, peak density of the ionosphere, and then on the limb, we get exospheric temperature and O2 density profiles. And these are um, just uh, radiance pictures of um, the oxygen emission and then the nitrogen LBH emission. And on the right are um, model simulations, which are basically a combination of Thai GCM and then uh, Stan Solomon's um, GLOW model, which is um, calculating the radiative transfer um, of different photons in the upper atmosphere. And what you can see in the gold emission, uh, basic, uh, you can see that the image is split in half, so you see a discontinuity across the terminator, and that's from stitching the two images together, because there's a small time lag between when the uh, bottom half of the disk is scanned and the top half of the disk is scanned. Another thing you'll notice in the gold image is that there is a rural activity in the northern hemisphere that hasn't been modeled in the uh, glow simulation. 
And then lastly, you'll probably notice it's a little hard to tell in some of this lighting, but in the gold images you can also get um, some noise that happens. And at geostationary orbit we have all kinds of different radiation that comes in, and when there's a geomagnetic storm, um, actually some of our images look like they have snow in them. And that uh, has to do with uh, the radiation that the detector is experiencing. Here's another example of some of the uh, oxygen emission uh, products. This is from last fall around Equinox. And this is every image that we took of the disk throughout a day. So you can see sunrise on the um, eastern limb all the way through um, sunset. Um, something I do want to point out that's kind of cool about the daytime uh, data is that you can still see the equatorial atmospheric anomaly, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But that is the, um, I don't know if, I don't think a cursor will show up, but it's the purple uh, on the night side there, and uh, you can even see bubbles, or in this case, it looks like the EIA has been pinched a little bit. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff that can be done with the daytime images. We also have nighttime images. Uh, right now we've only released Channel A images, so those are only Northern Hemisphere scans. Uh, but this is an example from Equinox this year, and one of the cool things is this, even though you can only see the northern crest, you can see definite bubbles within that equatorial ionospheric anomaly. And again, I'll talk about bubbles a little bit later. So before we even launched uh, gold and were able to start taking data, uh, I did some modeling of, of what we might be able to see. And most of this was based, again, on TIE GCM and GLOW. Uh, most of you should be aware with, of TIE GCM. Um, and then GLOW is a radiative transfer model of the FUV uh, atmospheric emissions of Earth. Um, so uh, panel A is the temperature of the upper atmosphere, uh, a profile um, at a basically a nadir position of the view of the satellite, so this would be 47 and a half degrees west at the equator. And then panel B is the um, electron density, so we're looking at the ionosphere. And then panel C is the mass mixing ratio, so that's kind of explaining what are the major constituents that we see in this region based on TIE GCM. And Based on some of those inputs and a couple others like geomagnetic activity and F10.7 and that sort of thing, uh, GLOW calculates uh, the uh, different brightnesses and different uh, spectral bands. So what I'm showing you right here are the 135.6 nanometer oxygen emission is the blue line in panel D and the uh, LBH bands um, are the blue or green line. Uh, in that panel, which both of them peak at about 160, 170 kilometers in altitude. Mm -hmm. So it's from this figure, the D figure, it seems LBH should be stronger. Why in the previous figure it seems like you have more noise? In the it depends on the time of day. So I think this one is 9 a.m. Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I was uh, thinking of the earlier figure mm -hmm. uh, that uh, when you look at uh, the LBH, you have more kind of speckles or dots, which I thought of noise. Probably. Yeah, they're, they're noise. Yeah. So it is noisier than LBH. It is a little noisier. And that has because when you look at 135.6 nanometers, you're taking a very narrow band and then excluding the rest of the spectra. And when you take the LBH, bands, it's a much wider range, and so you're adding in more noise by taking a larger chunk of the spectra. One of the things that we were particularly interested in seeing is if we could see gravity waves with gold. And one of the ways we did this is we took TIE GCM, which does not have explicit gravity waves in it and we added uh, a perturbation uh, in each column. 
And that perturbation had a gravity wave period tau of about three hours. We passed that perturbed tight GCM model through GLOW. And the hope was, once you remove the background, that you would be able to get back out that period tau. Uh, and you would be able to see the gravity wave that way. And lo and behold, when we run the models, um, this does work out. So this is, uh, so we took TIE GCM plus a three hour uh, perturbation in the vertical uh, columns, and we were able to get out that, that period again. So the solid line in these plots are Nader viewing, and then the dashed lines are looking off Nader. And one of the things to keep in mind is even though the off Nader view is, has a stronger response, if you're looking through more atmosphere and you might be looking through multiple gravity waves. So you need to be really careful about your interpretation of this. Um, so this gave us some confidence that we might be able to see something. And on October 13th, we performed one of those campaigns, those special campaigns that I was telling you about that we had the ability to do. And in this case, we basically parked channel A and channel B um, in the center of the disk and stared for I think like six hours. And what we were really just trying to see is if we could get a period or a fluctuation out of that. Um, the reason we chose uh, where we did is the idea was we were hoping, you know, maybe we would see some convection gravity waves or something like that. And that's why we picked that particular region. So this is um, the result that we got. So on the x-axis is time and on the y-axis is latitude. So you can think of this as, uh, as time marches by. The top row is from channel A and the bottom row is channel B. Um, and this is uh, just two ways to look at it. So the red is the raw counts. So this would be the level 1B data. And the blue is um, radiance or brightness. Uh, and so that would be like the level 1C data if you're interested in, in doing this yourself. The reason we had channel A and channel B was that the idea is if we saw a wave in one of the channels, we were hoping we would see it in the other channel and be able to determine um, speed and direction of that wave. So we do think we see some wave-like features. Um, so if you direct your attention to panel A, um, basically below about 50 degrees latitude, or above 50 degrees latitude, so between 50 and 70 degrees south, um, between about 12 hours and 15 hours, um, you can see two diagonal uh, perturbations there. And they are also seen in the brightnesses, so that gives us some confidence that it's still there. I would say they're actually a lot harder to see in channel B, which makes me a little concerned. but. Um, that was the result of that particular campaign. And given that it's so far south, um, the idea is like maybe these are our, um, traveling atmospheric disturbances that have been, say, generated from auroral regions or possibly even from the polar vortex itself. Um, we don't really have a lot of information on the sources of this particular disturbance, but um, that's, that's what we think it could be. So what is the travel mm -hmm. speed? It's a, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it's a medium scale um, TID sort of uh, speed. Um, one of the additional things we're able to do with this is use some modeling to try and go back and figure out what, if we have these brightness amplitudes, can we figure out what the temperature amplitudes and uh, density amplitudes of these fluctuations were. And so we did multiple model runs to estimate these amplitudes, which basically gave us a 35 or 34 degree Kelvin fluctuation in uh, temperature and then uh, about an 8.5% density fluctuation. And this is basically about a 1% fluctuation in the gold brightnesses. So it's pretty small, and that's why we have to use these special campaign modes to kind of stare and, and basically bring up our signal-to-noise ratio. 
so we have an idea for a future campaign what we would like to do is park one of the split slits in this approximate location which would be over the western atlantic ocean and what we're hoping to see are gravity waves emanating from a hurricane and this is off of some work that Han Lee and some other colleagues did that showed gravity waves emanating from a typhoon in the pacific ocean so we'd like to be able to see if we could see that so timing is part of the problem with this particular instrument because we have to basically send the commands to the instrument seven to ten days prior to when we want the instrument to do a special campaign mode so now it's up to me to basically be watching you know the different web pages and that sort of thing to pick out a likely hurricane that's still in the um, central Atlantic Ocean that looks like it's heading um, west uh, so that's been a little challenging especially if any of you guys have been watching the hurricane season it's been pretty quiet this year so far but um, on the one hand I'm hopeful we'll get to see something on the other hand I hope we don't have any hurricanes on the <laughs> eastern seaboard this year um, so we'll see what will happen we do already have the um, campaign mode set up and I think we may have driven down the lead time to about three to five days um, so we'll see how this works out so either we'll have a hurricane we can look at or we've missed a hurricane season this year so um, the next thing I want to talk to you about are solar terminator waves um, this is something that's um, I've been kind of interested in for quite a while um, what they are is when the Sun's shadow passes across the face of the earth there are very sharp gradients in energy input from the Sun um, and these generate fluctuations in temperature density and zonal winds and these so in this plot here on the right these are um, residual temperature or residual density fluctuations um, in color and then there is a black line which shows the terminator itself and one of the main features of these terminator waves is that they're not aligned with the terminator they're kind of 30 degrees um, offset from that terminator terminator and so that's what I'm looking for um, these waves have been theorized since the 70s um, just with that sharp energy input something should happen um, but it's really only been within the last 10 years and um, Jeff Forbes and some other groups have been able to see these sorts of observations um, with this is CHAMP data right here that you can see in the middle thermosphere. I think this phenomenon has been grossly overlooked um, when you look at uh, thermospheric variability. They have the ability to act as um, sources of gravity waves which in turn have implications for communications and navigation through uh, perturbations of the ionosphere. Um, they can interact perhaps with traveling ionospheric disturbances, uh, thermal tides. Um, they could be related to the midnight temperature maximum and midnight density maximum. This is another plot of what uh, this solar terminator wave looks like from CHAMP data. Um, and those colored lines are the terminator at different altitudes for the different seasons. Uh, and you, again, you can see that the uh, wave is basically about 30 degrees off that terminator line. Some of the open questions we still have about term, uh, solar terminator waves, I think we're pretty solid on um, characteristics of the temperatures, winds, and densities in the middle uh, thermosphere um, and how they change to solar conditions and seasons. But we aren't quite sure how solar terminator waves in the thermosphere and ionosphere are related. Those, the thermosphere and ionosphere are coupled, um, but it's not clear that the solar terminator wave will look the same in both mediums. Um, another really critical question in my mind is whether or not solar terminator waves are generated in situ in the thermosphere or whether or not they're generated lower down in altitude, say by um, solar heating of ozone and that the wave propagates up. Um, solar terminator waves, if they exist on Earth because of the sharp uh, 
solar input gradient should exist on other planets as well. So if we have instruments around other planets, so for example MAVEN around Mars right now, we should be able to see solar terminator waves, say in their INGEMS instrument, around Mars. And we could do some comparative aronomy there. Um, and then lastly, what I'm uh, kind of going to address here is whether or not these solar terminator waves can be observed in far ultraviolet emissions on Earth using the gold instrument. So one of the first things I did was to look at um, solar terminator waves with a model, and in this case I used WACAMEX, um, which includes the ionosphere extension. Um, this was a free-running version, so it wasn't forced by MERA on the lower boundary. And the first question you've got to ask is, does it internally generate these solar terminator waves um, by itself before you can ask any other questions? And the answer is, yes, it does. Um, so uh, this is uh, launch, or let's see, local time on the x-axis and latitude on the y-axis at 400 kilometers, so in the middle thermosphere, uh, for um, different solar conditions and seasons. Uh, so just look at the upper left-hand panel since that's one of the better examples. The black line is the terminator and then the colored line is the temperature perturbation. So in this case, the amplitude is only about 8 degrees Kelvin at this altitude, so that's pretty small. Um, but you can see that, again, the wave is not aligned with the terminator line itself, but is uh, canted off about 30 degrees. So this is at a set altitude, 400 kilometers. One of the things we could do is look at it um, in local time and altitude. So I'm going to take a slice right through uh, the maximum there where that white line is. And this is uh, the plot in local time and altitude here. So um, this is again 42 degrees uh, south latitude. You can see the solar terminator wave extends up into the thermosphere and then peters out somewhere around the mesopause. Um, although another group has found the solar terminator wave structure down into the stratosphere using another model. So this gives me some hope that we might be able to see some uh, features in the gold mission because the gold uh, uh, emissions are most sensitive at about 170 kilometers in altitude. Um, one of the other things I looked at was electron column density, which is um, similar to total electron content. Um, but it, it doesn't look like the other features. So again, remember how I was telling you that it was canted off about 30 degrees from the uh, terminator line, and that's mostly at dusk? Well, the feature that I see in the model is mostly at dawn and it follows the solar terminator line very closely. And that makes me a little nervous. Um, I kind of wonder if it's a numerical artifact at this point and I'm still trying to figure that out just because there's that sharp discontinuity at the terminator. But that is uh, still to be addressed and um, again we don't quite understand the relationship between the ionosphere and thermosphere solar terminator wave. So this is what um, the gold radiances look like. So that's local time and latitude. And then the white faint line is the terminator wave, uh, line. And uh, these are radiance differences once the background has been removed. Um, so can we observe a solar terminator wave in gold radiances? Right now, with the analysis I've done, I would say probably not, um, which is kind of disappointing. And I know you guys usually don't get uh, results of negative presented to you, but um, this, is, this is something that um, has been a challenge to, to look into. So the last topic we're going to talk about are equatorial atmospheric anomalies. Um, basically what happens is you have um, net positive charges on the dawn side and net negative charges on the dust side, and you get an electric field that points from dawn to dusk. And then you get a current that appears in the E region um, because conductivity abruptly rises and falls at the terminator and you get this equatorial electrojet. Then you have, um, and I'm running through this very quickly, but basically you have upward 
E cross B drift, and then field aligned plasma diffusion along the magnetic field lines. So what this really looks like is um, a trough or a bite out of plasma right along the geomagnetic equator, and then two peaks or crests of plasma on either side um, during geomagnetically quiet times at around 15 degrees geomagnetic latitude. So again, one of the things I tried to do was, um, before we were able to launch gold and start taking data, was model the equatorial ionospheric anomaly. Um, so that modeling work is uh, on the right-hand side under GLOW. Um, but when you compare it with the gold data that we took for a similar time, you can see in the gold data you have very two very well-defined crests on either side of the geomagnetic equator, which is the green line and they um, extend almost all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And they're very strong. But in the Taiji CM and GLOW model, we don't have the two very uh, defined crests and it peters out pretty quickly. Um, so I, I will fully admit that maybe I've done something wrong with the model, but um, it may be that the plasma is not being lofted high enough up in the model and then um, it recombines too fast, and um, you're losing some of the plasma crests. <coughs> so, these are gold um, movies of what the equatorial atmospheric anomaly looks like in gold throughout the night. Um, and so these are channel A and channel B scans. Channel A scans, are, I think, are in the northern hemisphere, and channel B scans are in this. I think they're both channel B scans, sorry. Um, this is from um, March of this year around equinox, and so you can see a very well-defined equatorial ionospheric anomaly, those two crests on either side of the atmosphere. And again, this is uh, only in the 135.6 nanometer emission. Um, you don't see the nitrogen emission um, as part of this. One of the things that's been um, really exciting about working on gold um, is that we've been able to see plasma bubbles. A plasma bubble is um, a feature where there's a sharp uh, gradient in the density of plasma. And in these images, it looks like bite outs of the crests of the equatorial atmospheric anomaly, or I sometimes think they look like tiger stripes when you have a large number of them stepping across. Um, and if you um, have the time to stare at this and look at this, you can even see the bubbles drifting eastward slowly. And one of the reasons we care about bubbles is these sharp um, gradients in plasma density basically impact communications and navigation signals um, and can cause some real world consequences uh, for, for different groups and organizations, including the military. Um, so these are bubbles at Equinox, which was expected because the equatorial ionospheric anomaly um, is generally strongest at Equinox. But we also saw some interesting things at Solstice. This is from last December, where you can see the equatorial ionospheric anomaly is not very well um, defined, but um, you can see some bubbles right about now um, so at the very end of this movie, um, you can see some bubbles that are propagating uh, east. So I'll let it finish playing. There they are. One of the other things that we can think about is um, what the daytime equatorial atmospheric anomaly looks like, because we've only talked about the nighttime. Really, this phenomena sets up around 10 a.m. local time and then persists uh, through the night. Um, so one of the ideas is that can we get some information about the daytime EIA um, that gives us uh, forecasting information about maybe the pre-reversal enhancement, the position of the crests? Um, can we figure out anything about bubbles? Well, one of the first steps uh, for me has just been trying to identify the equatorial ionospheric anomaly during the daytime since um, the brightness is so much greater during the daytime and the EIA is a very small component of that. So this is showing some results that I was able to do. Um, this is uh, for longitude and latitude. 
um, and these are re residual brightnesses. Uh, the magnetic equator is the wavy line, and then the vertical purple line is the terminator. So what you can see is that um, I can track the EIA right now at approximately two hours before um, sunset, um, which gives me some hope I'll be able to get some uh, insight into some of those questions um, I talked about earlier. Um, again, maybe pre-reversal enhancement or bubbles or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude there. Um, just to summarize, um, the Earth's upper atmosphere emits in the far ultraviolet, and we can use this information to uh, get a temperature and constituent uh, information of the thermosphere, and then also density of the ionosphere. Um, gold may be able to observe gravity waves in specialized campaign modes, and we have some planned coming up. Uh, solar terminator waves are something I find very interesting. Uh, but unfortunately, I haven't been able to find them in gold data thus far. And then lastly, uh, gold is able to observe uh, some of the details of the equatorial ionospheric anomaly, including bubbles and the daytime features. So with that, I'll go ahead and conclude. No, the problem with the night side is that it usually conflicts with the equatorial ionospheric anomaly. And so the feature that looks like the equatorial ionospheric anomaly is probably covering up some of the um, solar terminator wave feature. So, so far, we, uh, you have not seen anything like the night side. I was very hopeful, <laughs> but I, I haven't been able to, to find it yet. I think it might be easier to find it in a campaign mode. I mean, that's definitely a, a question that I've been thinking about. I think it may be, on, be beyond. I don't want to say that it is yet, but I think it may be beyond its detection mode in the, the scans. Here's how you extract the terminator wave from black mix friends. Like how do you how, how do you actually get that signal? Because there are super waves there. How do you know which ones are created by the right. terminator beating different? So I used it basically this I did the calculation very similar to the way that um, they were extracted from CHAMP data. And so you organize the data in local time and latitude and then run a high pass filter it is what I've been doing but if that is an inappropriate way to do it uh, we should definitely talk so what was the so what kind of period period do you expect this wave? what is your past are you doing? Uh, I need to go back and check my my calculations I don't know off the top of my head Any more questions so I guess all the emission measured by gold is a column that yeah. So what is the effective uh, thickness of the emission? Um, for the, I, I'm just wondering, maybe that some of the waves, it's not clear because you are integrating the high effect. In yeah. The, there's a active, so, you know, gradient that probably smear out. The right. Thickness. So if you look here, so unfortunately the 135.6 nanometer um, curve is kind of smushed. But uh, in panel D, you can see that it's fairly broad from maybe um, 130 kilometers to 220 kilometers. So it's, it's fairly broad. But the thing to keep in mind about if you're looking at gravity waves, the vertical wavelengths in the thermosphere are, are very long. So the only gravity waves that we'll be able to sense are going to be those very long vertical wavelengths. But good question. How many wavelengths do you have? How many filters do you have? Uh, so here you talk two, right? As yeah, I only have two. Okay. So, but we get the full um, spectrum between 132 to 162 nanometers in I 
think, 0.02 nanometer bins, is that right? It's roughly 800 amps. 800 wave bins. 800 wave bins. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So we have pretty good spectral resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so you mentioned the TIE GCM results and the, the FDIA on mm -hmm. that. Is it uh, run under exactly the same solar condition? Yeah, which are very low solar conditions. Okay. Yeah, because I know that the uh, Wacomac sometimes the, the PRE appear really late mm -hmm. uh, under solar main conditions. Oh, okay. So Maybe go investigate that. Yeah. Nope, they're independent. They can move wherever they we want them. For, for the same one, it's always uh, pointing to the same location. For? Is the fish. Oh, the f for the gravity wave experiment? No, just, just the instrument. So the, I the instrument is, the satellite is pointing fixed, okay. um, but the mirrors inside the instrument can move the slit. somebody who's a maybe a uh, stronger expert in gravity waves might answer this better than I can but my guess would be that the horizontal wavelengths are not coming through in the, the imaging technique that we're doing so I'm wondering if we either need to dwell longer in each location to get the signal to noise up or if we should separate the um, slits a little further apart so do they observe at They should be very similar. I, I, it's, it's a little mysterious to me too because they should be very similar. The same time, same location. Closely, yeah. close to the same location. Close to the same location. Is it possible that this could channel like the sensitivity depends on that? Actually, we've uh, had some problems with that. Channel A um, is doing a little better than channel B. Um, channel B um, had some early mission degradation. And so that's why we're depending more on channel A right now. Um, and it, it has to do with um, burn-in, basically, of the detector where it loses sensitivity over time. And one of the cool things about gold is that as that happens, we can then shift the um, grating and image a different part of the detector. So we can recover some of that sensitivity, but it ends up being a step function. And so it, there's always not continuity between the change in the diffraction grading location. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're related to that, then what is the projected lifetime of the mission? So we think that we have, a, at the current rate of degradation, we have about 10 years with the instrument. If we continue to get funding, um, the satellite that we're on has fuel for 30 years, mm -hmm. um, but one of the things with gold is we're on a different um, funding model than previous NASA missions, where in previous NASA missions there was a big capital cost up front to build the whole thing. Whereas with gold, the capital cost up front was lower, but because we're a hosted mission on SCS-14, we basically have to pay rent every year, and that rent is not insignificant. And so we'll see how NASA treats that going forward, if that made any sense. Yeah, sure. No, I'm just wondering about uh, its longevity relative to solar maximum. Yes. Yeah. Any more questions?